Uh, depending on your time zone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, welcome to the challenges in diagnosing and treating cystic fibrosis in different parts of the world with focus on low middle income countries. A webinar presented by the American Thoracic Society International Health Committee. My name is Samia Nasser. I am, and I am professor of pediatrics and the director of Cystic Fibrosis Center at the University of Michigan in the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology. I'm also the International Health Committee Chair for the American Thoracic Society, as well as a faculty member uh, for their uh, methods in epidemiology, clinical and operational research program. I am joined today by Dr. Balent Karadic. Uh, he is the head of the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology at Marmara University Faculty of Medicine as well as one of the founders of the Middle East CF Association. As well as uh, Dr. Hector Gautiers, uh, he's a professor, uh, division, uh, division director, and holder of the Raymond uh, K. Uh, Lirin uh, uh, Endowed Chair in Pediatric Pulmonary Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, Hearsing uh, School of Medicine at the University of Alabama uh, at Birmingham. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Grace Paul. Uh, she's an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of uh, Pulmonology and Sleep Medicine in Nationwide Children's Hospital. I would like to thank the ATS International Committee for developing today's webinar and our distinguished panel of speakers uh, for providing their insight in the challenges uh, associated with the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis in low middle income countries. All speakers have uh, extensive uh, um, knowledge and work in this area. Uh, before we begin, I have a few brief notes uh, and reminders. Uh, we have muted all participants due to the substantial number of registrants. Uh, if you have a question, uh, we encourage you to submit it uh, via the chat feature uh, on the webinar platform and we'll address it at the end of the session. Please note, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, to all registrants. Uh, the webinar uh, will also be posted in the ATS uh, website. Uh, please feel free to share the link with uh, your colleagues. The aim of today's webinar is to discuss cystic fibrosis and the disproportionate disparities in res resources to diagnose and treat uh, the disease in low middle income countries. Specifically, this webinar will be addressing the current status of CF diagnosis and treatment in some low and middle income countries and opportunities uh, for improving the current status uh, through the global uh, effort. Uh, we will begin uh, with all four presentations and then move on to the discussion at the end. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This is a session uh, about the challenges in diagnosing and treating cystic fibrosis in resource limited setting. Uh, it's uh, one of the International Health Committee webinars that we've been doing uh, with the American Thoracic Society. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the impact of collaborate, collaborative CF care between resource limited countries like Egypt and the University of Michigan to help improve care. I'll be covering a quick uh, overview about cystic fibrosis, uh, current status of CF in low middle income countries, uh, current status of CF in Egypt, and uh, obstacles uh, to CF care in Egypt. Uh, and then we'll go into the collaboration between the University of Michigan and the universities in uh, Egypt, uh, developing uh, limited guidelines and registry for them and a summary at the end. Uh, CF is an autosomal recessive disease. Uh, it's most common in Caucasians, uh, but it affects other ethnic groups as well, but to a lesser degree. The incidence in the US is uh, one in 3,000. There is around uh, 40,000 uh, Americans with CF, and that number has been increasing in the last few years because of the uh, improvement in care and living longer. More than 55% of these patients are uh, adults now. 
And uh, worldwide, the estimation is around 140,000, uh, but that is an underestimation because there are some countries that do not test for CF. Uh, CF is a disease that affects oh, almost every organ in the body, uh, but more, uh, most uh, affected is the lungs. Uh, we uh, always have uh, bronchiolitis, bronchiectasis, uh, bronchitis, pneumonias, atelectasis, hemoptysis, pneumothorax, core pulmonary, and the list goes on and on. It also affects the uh, digestive system, the intestine, the liver, the stomach, Dual bladder and pancreas, with 85% of the patients are pancreatic insufficient. The current status of CF in low uh, resource countries varies. Some countries uh, do not uh, acknowledge the presence of CF um, in there um, and they don't test for it. Uh, some countries acknowledge its presence but unable to diagnose it. Some countries are just starting to diagnose it, but do not have a management plan or do not have the resources or medications to treat it. And others uh, are diagnosing it, but treatment options are limited, like in Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, uh, CF presence was um, acknowledged in 2007. Prior to that, um, it was uh, uh, there were some studies in the 90s um, by geneticists there uh, speculating the CF is in Egypt, but nothing happened uh, till 2007 when a paper was published uh, uh, testing patients in pulmonary clinics and uh, gastrointestinal clinic in Cairo University and found that there are CF patients there. Following that, Cairo University started testing uh, in 2007 um, uh, after they bought their own equipment with the macro duct sweat testing. Other universities uh, tried to uh, get similar equipment, but they ended up having nanoduct sweat testing equipment, which is not a uh, diagnostic uh, testing for CF. Uh, it's more of a screening. So after years of lobbying, uh, in 2021, the Middle East CF Association and the uh, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation donated macroduct. Uh, sweat testing equipment to four universities there, Ain Shams, Zagazid, Asyut, and Sohag. And the idea was to try to spread out the universities around Egypt so it will be more convenient for patients to come in to be tested. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that we will have more equipment coming in to spread it even more uh, around the country. Mm -hmm. Alexandria University, which is uh, in the northern part of Cairo at the Mediterranean, um, have their own equipment uh, working with a lab there. Uh, that's in addition to Cairo University having their own equipment. And other universities and doctors are uh, around the country are uh, uh, sending their patients to be evaluated at these universities. Uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, workshop uh, with patients with CF uh, when we got the equipment to train other universities. One university was um, done well with that, and then the, the, uh, was teaching the other universities and also other physicians in a big conference. Um, so uh, that was just showing that. There are lots of obstacles uh, to CF care in Egypt. Uh, one of them is lack of awareness of significant number of Egyptian doctors, medical providers, and the public about the nature of the disease. Um, lack of the Egyptian uh, CF treatment guidelines, lack of registry, so we don't know how many patients are there. Uh, all the universities are diagnosing CF patients, but we don't have an accurate assessment of the number. Uh, lack of multidisciplinary team approach, as well as uh, clinical pharmacy. By the way, the estimation of patients right now in Egypt is around 800. Um, lack of infection control measures uh, in the clinics, and lack of governmental support and uh, for, for medications and for uh, research sponsor, uh, sponsoring as well. There is lack of training about nutritional support of CF children uh, that was uh, found out when I went in for a site visit there. 
Uh, there is also limited resources to improve nutrition. Uh, the high calorie diet, the appetite stimulants, and the gas, uh, the gastro, uh, gast, uh, G tube placement uh, are limited there. Uh, lack of physiotherapy training and inadequacy uh, uh, trained nursing support and social work and respiratory uh, therapists are not available. Usually the physicians end up doing that with not really much training. Um, there was inadequate uh, clinic space, even though now they are giving them more and then lack of uh, lack of or in uh, accessibility of most diagnostic measures. The, most of the lab testing parents have to pay out of pocket. There was a problem, there still is a problem with oropharyngeal swabs uh, that are not showing uh, any bacteria when they do it in CF patients, even though when they do bronchoscopy on that same patient, they do find uh, bacteria. So uh, there is a, pro uh, a deficiency of uh, processing, processing it accurately uh, when they get the result, uh, when they get the uh, material, and also when they transport it to the lab and when the lab gets it. Okay. Uh, lack of microbiology lab familiar with CF um, and specific organisms like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Lack of antibiotics uh, availability against multi-drug resistance. And most of the cultures are showing uh, multi-drug resistant to oral antibiotics and very few uh, IV antibiotics would be sensitive to it. Uh, of course, there is lack of modulators. Uh, there has been a huge effort to try to get uh, the modulators in Egypt, but uh, it has not been successful up to now. Uh, lack of uh, CF vitamins. So patients usually would have to use uh, separate vitamins, vitamin A, E, uh, D, and K separately. Uh, they don't have tobramycin there, but they do have uh, garamycin and amikacin, which they are using instead. Mucolytics, they don't have polmozyme or dornase alpha, but they do have, do have inestal cysteine, which they have been using nebulized. And the hypertonic saline, 3% is available, not 7%. The enzymes are available, their creon is available, but they are not being dispensed in the amount needed. So patients usually run out in the middle of the month. This is a picture of uh, some of the uh, collaborators with me uh, in, in Egypt uh, when I started the process. So the collaboration between the University of Michigan and um, the and four universities in Egypt, the ones that we uh, gave the equipment to, was mainly focused to increase awareness of the physician and staff about CF, to train faculty, staff, and families on CF care and airway clearance and nutritional support, to help connect with the nutritional department uh, some, some of these universities have very strong nutritional department and gastrointestinal department, but they haven't been working together. So part of the collaboration is to connect them and get them to work together. Same thing for physical therapy, for physical uh, medicine and rehab. Very strong uh, department, but they are not working together as well. So the, the goal of the collaboration was also to connect them to convince them to do multi-center, uh, multi, uh, sorry, uh, uh, multi-specialty multi uh, care for CF patients. Um, the multidisciplinary team um, has been important and actually started in one of the universities already. And help develop guidelines for how to treat CF. They do have the medications like I mentioned before, but they don't know how to use it or how long to use it for and when to use it. So that was another goal. And also to focus on registry so we have an accurate estimation of the presentation and the numbers of the patient there. <clears throat> for the implementation of or, or starting of the collaboration uh, in the fall of 2021, uh, there was an initial visit done by me uh, to each of the uh, four universities to, uh, and uh, connected with the administration to see if they can help them, if they can um, have a better uh, environment for the CF patients to be seen. And in the summer, 
and fall of this year, I spent around three, three months there uh, during my sabbatical, which was focused on my work in Egypt. And that allowed me to work closer with these universities and uh, develop guidelines and registry for them. Uh, we invited the physical therapist uh, from the University of Michigan to come in uh, to uh, Ain Shams University, which is in Cairo, and all the other four universities came in to that week of training. And uh, he was able to uh, work with the physicians, but more importantly, with the families. And actually, they uh, videotaped his sessions with different age groups uh, with the translation, so it can be available on uh, YouTube uh, for parents to watch. Our dietitian went, went, uh, came in as well, and um, uh, again, stayed in uh, Ain Shams with all the universities being there. Um, and uh, the same thing happened with uh, teaching the physicians, but also getting the gastroenterologist and nutritional uh, specialist to be involved with the CF team and also train the families of how to take care of their kids. In 2023, uh, the plan is to do two visits, one of them in the uh, spring, uh, to start working with one of the universities that would be Ain Shams University, which is more uh, suited for that, to start the quality improvement work with them. So that way, whenever they have the implement uh, a, a specific treatment plan, they can measure the improvement of that. Advocacy uh, and contacting uh, Ministry of Health will be starting in the spring. Uh, there is a family advisory board that was formed um, in, in the uh, summer of this year. And uh, that major uh, uh, goal for that is to help with advocacy in addition to the physician. And in the uh, fall um, of uh, 2023 will be uh, some members of the team from the University of Michigan will come in uh, to Egypt for more training as well. And in, in 2024 uh, will be more training of quality improvement for another uh, university while keeping an eye on the first one to make sure they are moving uh, appropriately. So um, the this is just a summary of the guidelines that was developed. I am not going to go over it uh, for the interest of time for them. And uh, a lot of the medications we use were substituted with what they have there um, to make sure that um, um, it's, it's feasible for them to use. We are trying to get them the uh, multivitamin, CF multivitamin, so it's easier for the family to use as well. The registry was developed um, and mainly very simple registry was uh, uh, to capture patient demographics, clinic visits information, microbiology information, medication and complication, uh, PFT data, and chest X-ray or CT. They seem to be doing uh, more CT than what I'm doing here uh, for evaluation. Uh, these are pictures of two patients uh, from there, and you can see how malnourished and how uh, stressed and uh, not in good shape they are. So in summary, acknowledging the presence of CF in low resource countries are the first step uh, to help uh, low resource countries in that regard. Diagnostic tools should be available or, um, you know, try to help with that. Uh, a lot of the time, the Ministry of Health in these countries will not uh, invest in buying it because they don't believe that there is CF there. So that's why the donations are very important. Educating physicians and public about the disease is needed. And uh, providing necessary medications is very important. Uh, so it's not important. It's not good enough to just diagnose it. And um, uh, training the medical team, especially about the proper nutrition and physical therapy is very important. And uh, finally, teaching the team about quality improvement to track their progress is uh, very important as well. This is the median survival of uh, CF uh, patients in the US, and I can see it's now uh, uh, in the 50s, and in Egypt is uh, below 10, 10 years of age. 
So we're trying to help to see if we can uh, at least narrow the gap a little bit. And thank you. Hello, uh, I would like to thank ATS for giving me the opportunity to share my experience uh, on the difficulties and diagnosis of CF in Azerbaijan. And also thank you for Sir Samia Nasser to inviting me to the, give this talk. So just I will talk briefly about what we have done in a difficult situation. So the 10 steps, the first was increasing the awareness among physicians with especially with education and the second one was establishing a patient organization then just giving the opportunity to diagnose the patients and supplying the country with sweat testing devices then of course the most important step was approach to required medicine giving the opportunity to uh, have all the medicine for the patients. Of course, lobbying was an important part of the project and establishing at least one CF center in the country. And afterwards, of course, uh, our aim was implementing a newborn screening program in Azerbaijan. And after this, of course, a national registry. Genetics is very important and also now studies have started for increasing the awareness of the importance of genetics and then in the end increasing the awareness among the public in the normal population so if we would like to have a general overview of the country the population of azerbaijan is approximately 10 million annual birth rate is 115 50000 per year so if we estimate the expected prevalence as one in the 5,000, number of expected patients uh, was 2,000. But uh, when you, we look at the current situation in the country, only 46 diagnosed patients uh, were there. So nearly less than 3% of expected. So normally we were expecting at least 20 or 30 patients uh, every year to be diagnosed in the country. So we start with the awareness, increasing the awareness with educational activities uh, among the physicians and also uh, the patient representatives and patients, uh, parents of the patients as well. And we started with a series of online meetings during pandemics in 2020 and uh, there were great uh, there was a great attendance rate uh, in some pay, uh, meetings it was uh, there was there were 60 uh, doctors and nurses who attended our meetings and also we organized joint meetings one speaker from turkey one speaker from azerbaijan on uh, just selected topics gastroenterology or pulmonology and also we organized a joint session at the turkish pediatric Pulmonary society congress in 2021 and it was also had a great success so when we look at the difficulties in diagnosis first of all absence of neonatal screening is a major problem uh, of course, lack of enough sweat testing facilities uh, was a main obstacle. Also, genetic testing was expensive and was not reimbursed by the government, and there was no specialized CF center. The first step was also establishing a patient organization, and there, this patient organization was established in 2017. And also in 2020, uh, they uh, became a member of CF Europe, patient organization uh, in the Europe. And they are so active and they organized a family school and they organized many meetings inside the country. And they have a website and now uh, you can find some information about them at the website uh, I gave in this slide. 
and they have a strong collaboration with the Turkish CF uh, patient organization as well. The second step was establishing sweat test devices. Uh, they were all granted by Middle East CF Association. So we are so happy to supply these devices also. Uh, I would like to thank CF Foundation for their generous support to Middle East CF Association as well. We supplied 2,000 diagnostic kits and these centers has now trained technicians to uh, perform sweat testing in the patients. Before, of course, before starting this project, uh, we had online meetings and online education and then practice sessions. And it was a great effort uh, by the technicians on our side and also in Azerbaijan. So they were so good to learn and practice sweat testing. So now when we look at the current situation in the country, there are two sweat testing centers and total number of sweat tests was, uh, were above 500 and 58 uh, tests were positive. Uh, and also nearly 100 patients has an intermediate uh, testing result. So uh, this is also another important point that we should focus on the genetics in order to have the diagnosis in many patients. The fourth step was increasing the uh, lobbying and increasing the awareness among the politicians. So uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, in the CF day in Azerbaijan, high rank officers and Minister of Social Rights were invited to a meeting. And we were so happy to learn that reimbursement of drugs was declared by the government, especially thanks to Haider Aliyev, found uh, for giving the, this opportunity to the patients. And treatments were supply, uh, started to be supplied to the, every patient periodically at the CF center uh, from this month. And then also when we look at the uh, lobbying uh, facilities and also education, uh, we had a round table meeting, face-to-face -face meeting in Istanbul last year. And also a member of the Azerbaijan parliament, head of the health committee was invited and he was so uh, eager to help us. And uh, so he was also active in these all these decisions taken by the government. And this first CF center was established in the beginning of last year in 2021. Uh, and also it was named after a patient who is still alive, only adult patient in Azerbaijan. And when you look at her picture now, she says, I want to survive. And this was a main message uh, for all the patients uh, in the, all around the country. And lung the, uh, function device was granted. And also this day, the uh, 12th of March, uh, was accepted as the National Cystic Fibrosis Day in Azerbaijan. And he, uh, always they will have meetings in this moment. And after this also, I'm so happy to learn that a uh, neonatal screening program was uh, accepted as a, uh, at least at this stage, unfortunately it's pilot, but I think it will be uh, so closely be nationwide. So it's an important step for the CF diagnosis in the country. And this, another important step is CF registry. Uh, the advantage of uh, Azerbaijan is now they have only one step, uh, one uh, CF center. So it will be so easy to start a national uh, CF registry now. And uh, they are now visiting the center regularly to get their drugs. So I think in the, the 2023, uh, they will start the CF registry. You can see the BMI values of the patients here. They are so low and you can see the picture of a patient who, uh, who is only 6.5 kilogram uh, at an age of two years. And also with regard to the genetics, uh, these are the results uh, published uh, by an, uh, at a local journal. And you can see there are two novel mutations in two, 31 patients. So I think we can detect more patients and new novel, uh, novel mutations in these patients as well. So lastly, we had a meeting 
10 days ago and you can see uh, we had three main uh, results of these meetings first of all i'm so happy to learn that the approval uh, it, reimbursement of nebulized dnas and tobramycin was approved after this meeting and a cf nurse has just started to work at the cf center and also national cf registry will start so there were uh, four me separate meetings, one for the officers, high rank officers. The second one was for the adult pulmonologists. Also, we pointed out at the importance of sweat testing in the bronchi adult bronchiectasis patients because they have many adult bronchiectasis patients in the, in, in the country. And also, all the pulmonologists and neurologists were uh, so eager to help us uh, for the diagnosis of CF and management of the CF. And also we had the opportunity to uh, visit the CF center in Baku and all these staff members were so happy and we are so happy to meet them physically after all these online uh, on-site meetings, online meetings. And I, I hope uh, we will have uh, opportunity to reach our future targets, uh, nationwide sweat testing devices, early and appropriate treatment, establishing a national CF registry and, of course, a better prognosis. So uh, we will not see maybe these unhappy pictures like that, uh, who uh, unfortunately passed away at age of 15. Uh, and in the future, we will get these messages uh, because all these patients are now wants to survive as the, all the patients in the Western world. So they are right, it's they are right. So I would like to thank all the supporters of this uh, collaboration and I want to see the most more fruitful results. Uh, patient organizations in Azerbaijan and Turkey and Middle East CF Association and also Turkish Pediatric Medical Society. And also I would like to thank uh, you for giving the opportunity to uh, share my experience. Thank you very much. Uh, based on the Lancet monograph that I had the fortune to contribute, uh, we identified several challenges in the developing world for advancing CF care. In general, teams get their experience to provide medical care via traditional learning methods, such as printed literature, attendance to medical conferences. As we know, these are not conducive to strengthening the functioning of the CF care team. What are those challenges? The um, appropriate training to properly function as a multidisciplinary team is lacking. A key aspect for addressing this was the recommendation of a sustainable and tangible partnership between high performance CF teams uh, and those uh, CF teams in developing countries. The partnership should focus on uh, in crucial aspects of CF care, including delivering standard evidence-based care that is adapted to the local settings, having a basic data management and registry infrastructure that support their care, and an active engagement and education of the local CF community and CF stakeholders. An additional challenge for the CF care teams in Latin America is the understanding of seeing themselves as a clinical microsystem. Uh, there is a lack of formal training in teamwork techniques. There is a very strong culture of professional autonomy among the different healthcare disciplines. It's not just among the doctors. Dietitians, kinesiologists, all are aiming to be autonomous. So there's no this confluence of partnership uh, in a way of multidisciplinary team is. There's also absence of tools, infrastructure, and incentive to facilitate the change that will lead to improvement. Thus the challenge was to change the paradigm from work from working as individual clinicians to be a team that is team-based care providers. They standardize the care they can able to apply the available evidence, they can cohort the patients on the basis of medical needs, 
and they can customize their um, care to meet the individual needs of the patients and their families. With that in mind, uh, and through the sustained support and funding of the CA Foundation, uh, the UAB team developed what we have called the Cystic Fibrosis Training Network, which at the beginning was a training program with two mentor teams, UAB uh, and Baylor at Texas Children's, UAB Coach Center from Chile and Argentina, and Fidel Ruiz and his team at Texas Children's uh, was working with teams from Mexico. What was the goal? The goal is to implement a sustainable training program of Latin American CF centers with two key drivers. One is the deployment of an effective, adaptable, and scalable training program. So those teams who are mentored by the U.S.-based teams become leaders in their respective countries and guide then a transformative care management that is adaptive to local resources, to the culture and customs, and the healthcare delivery. The CFTN has uh, several components that I will describe briefly now. One is training. As you see, their UAB team and Baylor team is taken in their respective countries. We also have data management and communication. Uh, communication happens via email, but mostly using distribution list in, with using the WhatsApp application. Data management and uh, basic registry is being um, developed using the REDCap platform. And with colleagues and partners from Sweden, we are integrating patient-generated data using the Genia app. Education occurs um, outside the one-on-one -on -one in via symposiums that we have carried in Chile with uh, probably 15 or 17 teams in Argentina just before the pandemic with over 35 teams. Remember, we only are coaching two teams in Argentina, but additional teams who are very curious and willing to know what we are doing with those uh, leading teams join in this symposium. We have parent education days. We have done it in Chile and Argentina as well, and I'm sure Fidel has done it in Mexico. And finally, we have collaborations. Collaborations, again, I, uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been instrumental in this. Uh, we have partnered with the Ministry of Health in Chile, uh, who is creating a, now a CF Center network. Um, global collaboration with the CF Registry as we are participating with an area of the world that um, is not part of this. We have been invited to collaborate with them, as I mentioned, Genia, and also the Argentinian Association of Medical Professionals Caring for CF. And this is a summary of what uh, the CT Fibrosis Training Network is. One aspect uh, that we consider the core of the training of um, CF teams in Latin America is the benchmarking visit. It's a bi-directional. Um, the coach, UAB or Baylor, visit their teams in Argentina, Chile, or Mexico and we perform direct observation, workshop, networking, informal team meetings, and also uh, as activities for managing up and managing out. When their teams visit our centers in Birmingham or Houston, uh, in this week intensive uh, work, they observe firsthand how we work as a team. Uh, managing the inpatient and the outpatient uh, CF care and also provide direct classroom education and a significant amount of team building and quality improvement activities. This has been a success. 
We have additional tools for the CFTN. Uh, they're described there, the website. We have uh, a video repository in the Vimeo platform. We use several digital tools that um, enhance our communications and at a low cost for uh, the work that we do with the CF teams. And the CF Foundation, for instance, has added a lift serve for um, the professionals in Latin America. With this in mind, and uh, given the success, the CF Foundation invited us to uh, create a training program for U.S.-based teams. Um, this was just awarded, and I'm happy to report that Boston, Stanford, Columbia University will be joining our teams from Houston and Birmingham. And also there is a conversation with the European CF Society and CF um, Europe to add a team from Europe to take a country in that area. So we now have additional countries, um, Stanford is taking Peru, Columbia University is taking Ecuador, and UAB is considering adding Uruguay. So this is a growing uh, collaboration that has been very successful for us. Lastly, um, this is just a summary of the acknowledgement that uh, our team has been essential um, in performing uh, all this and managing the teams. Uh, UAB has been um, very supportive of my work uh, in this and certainly the CF Foundation. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for this opportunity to participate in this webinar on CF care and low and middle income countries. I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. My work in India is currently supported by the CF Foundation. I would like to talk on the epidemiology of global CF, followed by the importance of collaborative care and share experiences from our CF India demonstration project. We'd also briefly talk about the disparities that currently exist in access to highly effective modulator therapy. When we look at this map, we can see these areas where, the, where it is red or maroon. Those are the areas where there is a very well-established CF registry. And so much of our confirmed CF diagnosis numbers comes from these registries. As you can see, worldwide around 105,000 patients have CF. Uh, 37,000 live in North American areas. About 48,000 live in Europe, and that is in 40 countries. What is obvious is the amount of information from Iran, uh, from Asia and Africa is very minimal, and it is the numbers seem to be very low considering the amount of uh, population in these areas. So, based on some global estimates, the actual prevalence may be about 162,000. This map shows some hotspots where there could be high numbers of CF patients based on, again, population size and the high level of consanguinity. <clears throat> Talking about CF in the Indian subcontinent, for, from India, the data that exists shows that the prevalence is around 1 in 10,000 to 40,000, with an incidence of 1 in 40,000 to 100,000. So all these numbers are very low, but even at this rate, if you extrapolate it to the current population of 1.4 billion, it comes to around 700 to 2,700 new patients per year. The CF mutation carrier frequency varies between 0.4 to 4.5 percent based on published reports and needs further validation. The um, allele frequency of F508 del is around 20 to 30 percent. So there is a dire need for early diagnosis and intervention because there is high morbidity and mortality. And we must acknowledge that there are multiple challenges to providing optimal care in India and many other low and middle income countries. Moving on to the impact of collaborative care, the CF India demonstration project commenced in May of 2018. My team from Nationwide Children's Hospital collaborates with Dr. Sneha Varki and Christian Medical College and Hospital in South India, and our project is supported by the CF Foundation. I'm very grateful to Dr. Campbell and Dr. McCoy for helping us jumpstart this project and for the ongoing support from the CF Foundation. So the goals of our project was one to um, for capacity building, then to increase CF awareness among physicians and families, 
then improve diagnostic capabilities and improve standard of care for these patients. So how did our collaboration help? So first is capacity building. We work on building a team, so established a CF care team. We had our team from Nationwide Children's and Dr. Sneha's team in India, and we had a lot of educational sessions. There was mutual travel, and our goal was to train the trainer. And once that was established, there, there is a good partnership between our pulmonary department and their respiratory department. So there's ongoing knowledge share and training. Um, our institution also offers a international scholarship through which um, at least three or four doctors from um, India came to Nationwide Children's and um, participated in three to four month observership and CF um, specific GI concerns or pulmonary concerns. We were also able to help with some infrastructure building in terms of diagnostic equipment and clinical lab equipment. The other internal collaborations include um, collaborating with the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and the Indian Council of Medical Research. These are very important to sustain any project of uh, this kind. We have a good uh, network with the community physicians who are a huge referral base and also with tertiary centers in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. This is our team, Dr. Sneha, with doctors, nurses, uh, the technicians who do the sweat test. And this was taken during our visit to India. The second part was physician education. So it was first important to change the mindset that CF does exist in India. It was always thought to be a Caucasian disease. So it was re-educating uh, physicians that somebody with severe malnutrition and recurrent pneumonias it need not be individual diseases but could be cystic fibrosis so we had to target our education to varied levels of cf knowledge varied clinical settings and in different languages and resources and this we achieved by physician workshops as shown here cmes and many cf interest groups so we have provided hundreds of lectures to thousands of attendees and there are many youtube educational videos that are currently available and we, um, between uh, physicians, there is a very good um, established telephone and WhatsApp consultations. Um, so all of this education has directly increased referrals for CF testing. The third part was patient and family education. So we helped uh, our team when we visited, we helped educate uh, families on CF routine and acute care. Those cultural, financial and societal challenges that they face are very different from ours. So it, it is a very important factor to address though. So we would teach based on level of parental literacy, their socioeconomic status, the languages, which are multiple in India. This is a picture of us providing genetic counseling to this uh, young family with a neonate. The other interesting uh, or, or increasing group is parent support groups between e US and India. So immigrants from India who are settled in the US but have children with CF are now very keen and eager to encourage and provide hope and resources to parents of children uh, with CF in India. So this is a very um, refreshing um, network that is happening uh, and um, we want to encourage more partnerships like this. With regards to improving clinical care, so first we need to know what are the challenges. So because there is, uh, from a diagnostic angle, there's lack of newborn screening and limited availability of diagnostic tests, so there is daily diagnosis. From care standpoint, most of the care is self-paced, so it is very expensive to sustain CF therapies. And then limited or no availability of basic CF medications. Um, so many patients have to ration out um, Freon or um, or um, other aerosols here. And there is no pulmazyme or um, modulator therapy available at this time. Distance to travel. So our center is in South India here, and many patients come from West Bengal and Bangladesh, which is thousands of miles away. And there's a lot of focus on endemic infections. So because we're missing um, these, uh, or there is delayed diagnosis, so what are the consequences? So just with our patient data, so since 20, 2009, around 155 patients have been seen at our center. And then in the last four years, 115 of them actively followed our around 82. But you can see that around 27% of the patients have actually died. And then when you take a breakdown of kids uh, younger than two years of age, 
the number of new diagnoses has increased, but the number of infants who are dying is also very high. So if you just look at per year, around 40 to 50% of the infants have died. And this is because of pneumonia or respiratory failure, malnutrition or dehydration. You can also see severe pulmonary morbidity and then severe malnutrition, which clearly in this graph, you can see that the child is malnourished when they get creon, they improve, and then there's large gaps when they do not get any creon or loss to follow up. And so the level of malnutrition and related complications is very high. So what have we done for this one? So for diagnosis, I mentioned that we worked on a lot on education. So increasing awareness, increased referrals. We also emphasized a lot on clinical diagnosis and improved our access to sweat chloride testing. And as you can see, the number of sweat tests have increased tremendously. Um, with the current um, funds, we are able to do genetic analysis and we do have information from about 120 patients. From a medical management standpoint, we have clinical protocol, we have created some clinical protocols using cost-effective indigenous resources for routine care, infection control, antibiotic use, uh, how do you supplement calories, et cetera. We do offer a shared care more models because many patients um, travel long distances. Um, we've, we have focused a lot on um, appreciating the input of di the dietitian and the respiratory therapist and the specialist support. One of our achievements was um, the introduction of a single vial 7% and 3% hypertonic saline. This is this picture is showing our dietitian explaining how to uh, make high calorie foods to a mother who's weaning her, her child. And then many of our patients have handheld devices. The other academic in, uh, achievements from this collaboration, uh, we've been invited to, for many presentations at local, regional, international levels. We have a few publications and many are in progress. And then from a research angle, there's a lot of interest in uh, within India to do CF research. So the Indian Council of Medical Research is uh, very active in this. There is potential for US-India research, but there, uh, the rules are very strict. So we, we have to be very careful about that. Talking briefly about access to CF uh, tier modulators. So again, similar uh, data from the first slide that I showed, total number of patients is estimated to be around 162,000. Out of those around uh, 105 are our confirmed um, uh, diagnosed CF patients. But even among this, only what, from uh, if, I, if I take 20 or approximately 20,000 by 105,000, so that's around 20% of the patients are those who actually have a diagnosis and are getting treated with modulators. That is a very low number. So why is that? So first of all, there is a difference in uh, worldwide standards of care. Again, these areas in green are where there's very comprehensive care and a lot of the areas in red and blue, there is minimal care. And even among the countries, the developed nations, there is difference between, um, for example, European nations on how many uh, access to a modulator therapy. So even that varies. So that is one factor. The second is newborn screening availability. So as you can see, again, uh, the green areas are where there, the orange areas are where there is newborn screening. But um, many parts where the actually the population is so high, like India, China, and Africa, there is no newborn screening. So we are probably missing a lot of babies with CF. And now because we're not diagnosing them, them in infancy, there is no more, we're not doing any genetic testing. And we the point of um, CFTR modulator uh, does, is not even a question here. Um, we know that this, this is based on U.S. data, that even among patients living in the U.S., there is dis, uh, difference in eligibility for modulators between non-Hispanic white, African-American, or Hispanic. And, and this graph shows the number of studies that are um, um, describing race and ethnicity, and for very small percentage of studies on trikafta address race concerns. And then this uh, graph shows that minorities are underrepresented in pharmaceutical trials. So this is the actual number of patients of a specific uh, of Latino origin, but how many are represented in CF um, research. So modulator eligibility and availability may increase genetically based disparities. 
So from our Indian cohort, we are, this is data from 107 patients. So you can see F508 Delta is the most common. And these uh, five mutations are our most common mutations in our cohort. And when I look at what would be eligible for modulators, around 60% of the patients are eligible for currently available modulators. The sad thing is that um, by the time modulators are available in India, um, majority of these patients would have either died or have severe end organ damage by that time. So um, there is a need to make a change. And then 10% of the mutations will not respond to current modulators. So another factor for um, the disparity is the cost of um, a medication such as uh, Trikafta, the combination. So in the US, one year's um, um, cost is around $325,000 per patient. And then this is similar in many European nations. There's a company in Argentina which is trying to manufacture um, the, with the same constituents, a generic version, which is still one third the price. But then, um, there was a recent uh, um, presentation at the con CF conference where um, they noted that the actual um, cost, pharmacological ingredient cost was only around $5,000. And then the actual production cost was only $5,600. So um, this really needs to be addressed to improve access for all patients. And then finally, that is patent restrictions for right now um, for, ETI, the patent will expire in 2037, so that's around 15 years from now. So lastly, I would like to acknowledge my team from Nationwide Children's, Dr. McCoy, Dr. Splanger, who was always inspirational, my pulmonary team and the grants team. Um, for the CF Foundation, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Al Faro, the global health team, and the grants team. And none of this would be possible without my collaboration with Dr. Sneha Varki and the team in India. And um, even though many things look bleak, I do believe that the seed for a better tomorrow can only be planted today. So thank you again for this opportunity, and I am happy to answer questions. Uh, any questions? So we'll just give it a few minutes to see if anybody have any questions. But uh, in the uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like to thank everybody for excellent presentations. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, wait for the discussion as well. Um, the other thing is um, the, the webinar, we couldn't really cover the whole world. We just covered some of the areas uh, that, that um, it's been, it's been um, you know, having work is being done. So, um, so if, if there is any areas that we uh, did not include, I, I apologize. Uh, in advance for that, but for the time limits, we just focused on these four um, areas that we talked about. Um, I know that Christine uh, uh, Nook is on the line and uh, she might wanted to say a few words um, if we can uh, uh, open the mic for her. Hey everyone, I thought they were really great uh, presentations. Glad to, especially because I wasn't that up on where you were with Azerbaijan. I have heard both Samia and Hector often, you know, talk about their program. So I'm really happy to see the progress you're making there. And it always seems to come back to the three key things, which is what MECFA focuses on. And I don't think that they are one first or one has a higher priority. I think they have to begin and they have to start together and it's diagnostics, it's advocacy, and it's the training for the CFs. Now, when you break the training down, that can start however, uh, introductions, swap, or QI, however you wanna do it. But if you don't have access to medication and you don't have the support of the government to help fund the centers and to keep the staff available to set up the registry, to do genetic testing in the future, uh, you don't see much result, in, from my experience, in the developing world of over 25 years in CF now. And we've tried implementing just education, or we've tried, you know, to just go in and create a patient organization and things like that. It just doesn't progress. It takes years and years. But we're watching now by putting together, with the help of the foundation, they've been so wonderful for us, uh, going in with diagnostics, 
at the same time advocating using the diagnostics as a carrot to the Minister of Health and say, look, I'll come into your country, I'll give you diagnostics for a couple of state hospitals, two or three state hospitals, and uh, train your clinicians to have CF teams and work on a couple year program of training, whether it be virtual or in person. But in return, you have to make access to the drugs. And that works because he stands there and says, okay, when we had our first meeting with Jordan Minister of Health, it was almost comical because he come away with, what do we have to do? Just supply drugs, I'm supposed to be supplying them anyway. So, okay, I'll supply the drugs. But I think it helps to have, you know, the carrot, I call it, leverage to, to, to lobby and advocate. So I hope as we do move forward and I see that the developing world is becoming more of a concern for clinicians around the world in the CF Foundation and it's really pushing it. I hope we focus on those three things and I hope we do it simultaneously because I think it's a mistake to go into a country and start education when you don't have access to drugs or diagnostics. I think it's a mistake to go in and, and, and offer drugs and no education because then you have drugs and clinicians who don't understand how to uh, use the drugs in their treatment plans. And I think diagnostics is core. What, where are you if you can't diagnose? I mean, honestly, we go into countries that, I think it's, Gaza is a perfect example. They cried for us for years. Oh, we have 350 patients. We have 300, oh, four, 500 patients. And Dr. Nizreen, we finally got her through the wall and into Gaza only to learn that there's maybe 70 patients in there that are actually CF. Yeah. So that's how it gets, and I think that's a big problem too in the developing world. You start training doctors without diagnostics or uh, any way to clarify the diagnosis and everybody all of a sudden has CF. You go, go into a country and I got five patients and two months later, they've got 750 patients. We've seen it too, haven't you? I mean, they will exaggerate their patient numbers every time. So. That's the only thing I would have to add. I hope as we go forward in the developing world, we focus on advocacy, the training, and definitely diagnostics. And, and again, for Metro, we've gone even further by creating a program where we can offer the, the ministries of health low-cost drugs. We've made arrangements with pharmaceutical companies to get generic brands in. We're starting to implement that program in Tunisia and Jordan, and we'll see how that works. But when you lobby, you have to have options for them as well. It's good to, you can use the leverage and everything, but being able to offer a low cost drug or generic, that does phenomenal when to get a yes and to get approval. So thank you very much, Christine. That's wonderful. Yes, I totally agree with you. And also uh, whenever you work with uh, uh, an area or, or a country, um, you need to have the trust of the, of the people there that you're working with. So, um, but, you know, I've been working in Egypt since, like early 2000s and finally got somewhere now because we have the equipment, we have the diagnostics, then we've, you know, I identify the medications and then, and then we're doing the training and, and establishing family advisory boards. So totally agree uh, on that. Uh, any, any other things, any of the uh, balanced wanted to add? There are some questions here too. Oh, hi. Um, I'd like to answer some of the questions. One is the how can patient advocacy organizations partner with organizations in other countries? The in our experience working with Latin America uh, is that the parents organizations are exclusively aiming to get resources for caring for their children, meaning medications and um, treatments. So that's their main goal because they're, they're, it's not it's different than what we see at the CF Foundation uh, Parents Association in the U.S., where they are more systematic in, in a kind of a more global aspect of CF care. So it's very difficult for the families who has nothing uh, trying to change what their efforts should be, and that limits and fragments the way that they organize themselves. Um, I recently was fortunate to visit uh, Mexico, and we met with several parents association, and it's, um, it's just striking to me the fragmentation that they have, not because they want to be different, it's just because they have so many local uh, needs that it, it just 
go back again to what they need mostly, which is medication and access. So it's very difficult to get uh, them working together as a uh, umbrella organization. That was discussed in Mexico uh, three weeks ago, but um, I'm not sure if that would be fruitful. But that's an idea. Yeah, we, we, you know, I have the same situation. In Egypt, we have uh, we we developed the family advisory board. They are very anxious. It's very early on. Um, they they are willing to help, but then. Um, Connecting them with another organization that's more established and they are more um, savvy in doing advocacy is really important because they are they are uh, waiting to to do something but they don't know what to do because they are not organized enough. So I really think it is important to um, connect them with somebody that is more advanced in that. And there's another question of Laura Bono on how to increase health equity. Well. The problem with health equity has many aspects uh, from having an adequate, adequately trained provide, provider to have an adequate uh, place to where you can re receive outpatient and inpatient care. It's not unfrequent that a patient who has a, an infection uh, is put in a common uh, room with three or four other patients because there's no resources. So. The, uh, how to improve equity? One thing that we have done, and I know Fadel is in the in the um, uh, participant list, uh, is to focus on training the teams to perform better. And one of his questions actually was to how to improve that acquisition. When the teams know better how to function, they start to actually improve the quality of their data gathering. Um, making it better and uh, more pointed to what is really needed for them. Once they start to know their system, they start to understand what they need to gather. It's not like us having a registry. Uh, a re registry will be eventually there, but they need to start uh, small. And by, again, by having equity and equities at many levels, I mean, some other person put about um, medication access to CFTR modulators. Uh, that's a challenge everywhere, not just for uh, low resource countries, it happens to well-developed countries as well, that those medications are not available. Um, it's, it's difficult to change. And just to add to that, um, you know, so the data acquisition, like for example, in Egypt, uh, we developed a registry for them. And I thought all of the universities will be able to uh, you know, put information there, then we can access it and see what's going on uh, in the presentation. But apparently there is some mistrust between the different universities. I mean, they didn't tell me that, but it is what it is. Um, and instead of um, doing that, I told them each university can do their own data entry and then we can look at it separately. Uh, so it's, there is a lot of obstacles to collect data there. And uh, usually the physicians are the ones that's entering data too, so nobody else. Does it? Uh, anybody else in, like uh, Grace or uh, Poland, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Was, oh. Sorry. No, I think India, we are in a, very much in a, in a preliminary stage, and but a lot of internal networks are trying to gather patients. Um, so there is a very preliminary work on uh, registry building. Um, the physicians who are taking care of these patients, they are also like, you know, collaborating. And now the families are also a source for like, um, because now they have closure that the child, the, there's a diagnosis now. They know why their three prior children died. And so now they are like, oh, my child has this. And because everybody, it's a very, um, you know, close knit um, community. There's a lot of like, okay, why don't you also go to get tested? Why don't you do this? So that's how we are starting our, data gathering or at least inclusion at different levels. So uh, there's lots to do and there's a lot of quality control that needs to be maintained when um, we are making this registry. So there's a lot of, there's work started, but it's preliminary stages. And, and there is a question from, from Al. Thank you, Al, for, for uh, uh, logging in and, and joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, so why are the patients are having multi-drug resistance in Egypt, even though they are naive 
uh, population? Well, they are not because in Egypt, uh, if you cough, they give you antibiotics. If you sneeze, they give you antibiotics. If you have abdominal pain, they give you. I mean, antibiotics is not regulated by prescription. So you can go to the pharmacist and say, I have a runny nose and they'll give you something. So I think that is, uh, you know, I when I was there, um, nasalite was like so widely used. I was like petrified. It's like, are you kidding? It's like, yeah, yeah, we're using nasalite because it's cheap. So it's also it's cheap and it's available and they just use medications. Um, you know, antibiotics is like water there. So like anytime I, I turn around, there is patients on antibiotics. If I say, oh, I have a headache, they somebody offer me antibiotics, even though they know I'm a physician. So it, it is uh, the, the culture in that country, which is really interesting uh, to me. I don't know if that's unique to Egypt or if it is um, somewhere else in other under, underdeveloped or, or uh, low middle income countries as well. Oh, no, I, I can say the same issue uh, is uh, same for Turkey as well. Also, we have a very great amount of usage of antibiotics in the normal population and also, and sometimes very, a high grade antibiotics for uh, just a uh, basic uh, pneumonia. Uh, so it's a common problem. And also I would like to add something uh, with the previous issue that with the, uh, the uh, data acquisition, I think uh, this, now the data gathering is not uh, exactly the same thing about the re registering the Western world, but I think the first step should be that, that the centers should know their patients' characteristics. They don't know anything about them, and uh, just they have an idea. But if you have an at least an Excel file, and you if you, they can see the results of their own patients, then they can start to improve themselves. So in order to uh, start a national registry or center-based registry, I think personalized or individualized approach is a must because it differs from country to country, even center to center. So I think. For example, now we heard four different uh, uh, stories about uh, different regions of the world. And there are so, of course, there are so many common things, but there are so many different things just specific to this country uh, itself. So we should be careful about that and we should respect the values of these countries and the, uh, their uh, uh, properties. Totally agree on that, and and uh, you know I'm I'm originally from Egypt, but uh, not knowing the culture when I go there, it's kind of uh, um, you know I I learned there things that I was like oh really I didn't know that. Um, so working with them and respecting um, the the country's culture and uh, the way they are thinking and not to minimize anything they are saying, but trying to uh, work with them on things and try to change uh, mentality a little bit uh, would be a good thing too. I would like to add that um, in our work, and uh, Fadel from uh, Baylor uh, probably shares the same sentiment, the transformation of improving care in low resource uh, settings is absolutely doable. Uh, the quality of the people, just see it in this, in this panel, you know, India, Chile, Turkey, Egypt is represented. We're all based in the US, but uh, our colleagues from Latin America, from Africa, from the Middle East are completely capable of doing that. They just need the opportunity. And uh, I'm very grateful that foundations and associations in, in the US and MECFA in the Middle East and Sea of Europe are able to support the uh, enthusiasm and the interest of our teams. Um, I think this is absolutely um, a growing opportunity for other teams to take care and, and take the challenge. It's, it's doable. It's not, it will not achieve the resources that we are so fortunate to have in the OECD uh, countries, but clearly can do better. Just ask Saudi Arabia beating Argentina in the World Cup. <laughs> Yeah, they're out. But anyway, um, so actually, I, I totally agree on that. And I can, I can tell you that when I go to Egypt and to Turkey as well, and um, saying that I'm from the US and the FIA Foundation is supporting me and MICFA is supporting me, I get so many mileage out of that. And actually, administration listen to me. 
And when I say I wanted to have you as a center of excellence, everybody is, is listening and, and, you know, having, you know, so the collaboration with the U.S. centers is, is crucial. And I can't say enough about the, the uh, support from the foundation and from MICFA because that goes a long way there. So to really help them work together and improve care. I mean, like, like I mentioned, the Inchamps had a great nutritional department and, uh, and the GI department, they don't work together. But when I went there and I said, well, you need to work together, they start working together. And the, the physical therapy department, the same thing. So I really, I think it carries a lot of weight when you come in from the US and work with them uh, to, to help them understand and get, get their care higher. So there's one question on <clears throat> how would we access medications and uh, reduce the cost. So again, going back to the same paper that was uh, I had referenced, one of the thoughts on reducing cost was voluntary licensing by the original um, industry. And I think this has worked in, um, in anti-HIV drugs and some cancer drugs. And you know, I'm just going by what was presented recently. Um, it's sort of, you know, without obviously knowing the full legalities of this, um, from what I'm reading, it could be a win-win situation for the pharmaceutical company and for the patients. Um, but that was one of the thoughts on how we could improve access to medicines, like basically providing, um, voluntarily providing permissions for generic medication um, or manufacture, import, sale, uh, so that the just by sheer number of patients who would benefit, you know, the company may generate the revenue by like that. So uh, again, I, you know, many others are more experienced in how you get the medicines. Uh, in India, it's right now seems impossible, but uh, there has been a lot of work on other drugs. So hopefully someday this will work for us also. All right. Anything else before we close? Well, thank you very much for all the excellent sessions uh, that we had and also for the discussion. And as a reminder, this recording will be made available to all registrants and posted at the ATS website as well. So please um, you know, share it with your colleagues, um, send us uh, questions. If you have uh, any question, please email us. Uh, we will be happy to answer that. And thank you very much for the atten uh, attending and we wish you good health. So thank you.